The Office of the National Security Advisor has confirmed that Nadim Anjawala, a suspect in the ongoing criminal probe into the activities of cryptocurrency company Binance in Nigeria, has escaped from lawful custody. Spokesman of the Office of the National Security Advisor, Zakari Mijinyawa, says Anjawala, who was an executive at Binance, fled Nigeria using a small good passport. The National Security Advisor has now activated its dragnet involving Interpol to apprehend the fleeing suspect. According to Zachary, the personnel, the personnel responsible for the custody of the suspect have been arrested, and a thorough investigation is ongoing to unravel the circumstances that led to his escape from lawful detention. Meanwhile, the federal government has initiated criminal proceedings against Binance, a cryptocurrency exchange platform at the Federal High Court in Abuja. The lawsuit slams Binance with a four-count charge bordering on tax evasion. Joined with Binance as second and third defendants in the suit are Tigran Gabanyan and the now asconded Nadim Anjawala, both senior executives of Binance. Chairman of the FIRS, uh, the Federal Inland Revenue Service, Zakios Adidiji, has clarified that the escape of the Binance Regional Manager for Africa does not in any way affect the tax evasion charges against the cryptocurrency platform. Adidiji made these remarks while addressing State House correspondents at the end of the Federal Executive Council meeting at the Villa. Nadim Anjawala was detained in connection with an ongoing criminal investigation into Binance's activities in Nigeria, fled custody, according to officials on Monday. Following Anjawala's escape, Nigeria's Security Advisor's Office stated that it is collaborating with Interpol to address the situation. Revenue, it doesn't matter because we are dealing with company, not individual. So irrespective of where they are in the world, we have what it takes to make sure that they come and they comply with our law. So it doesn't matter whether the man is here or anywhere in the world. As long as we have Binance, there is no way they will escape the compliance uh, matter that we file against them. So uh, I don't think we have any problem in that. Joining us now on this show for an assessment of what must have transpired and what should be done to rearrest the fugitive is Mike Ejofo, former director of the Department of State Services. Good morning, Mr. Ejofo, and thank you for joining us on the morning show. Well, good I mean, morning. Good how morning. did it happen that the man that was in state custody would just disappear like that? We were told that he went to the mosque to pray in the spirit of Ramadan. Religion is a private thing. Couldn't he have prayed in the guest house where he was kept in custody? And why was he kept in the guest house and not in, uh, you know, uh, 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 other facilities of the state? And how did he just appear and showed up in the Middle East away from Nigeria? I mean, what kind of, uh, uh, you know... Uh, well, don't let me use the word I want to use. But you are the security expert. Can you tell us, is this how people escape from custody, from uh, correctional facilities? <laughs> and Nigeria will come and say, we are looking for the uh, man we were keeping. Oh, God. What a country. Over to you. <laughs> Dr. Ruben, you make me laugh, but this is not a laughing matter. It's a very serious matter. <laughs> uh, because you've raised a lot of questions that has been agitating my mind since uh, this uh, ugly incident. Honestly, this is a national, if not international, embarrassment to our own uh, image as a country. Uh, you raise a lot of questions. Who was prosecuting the executive? EFCC, of course. And uh, it should have been in the custody of uh, EFCC. So why the custody of uh, uh, NSA? Does NSA have facilities to keep suspects? And uh, a, a lot of questions. I've, I've come to the conclusion that it's either uh, gross negligence on part of the uh, officers on duty or compromise. But more likely is the issue of compromise. Why do I say so? You, somebody in custody 
ordinarily shouldn't have come in with uh, clothes, a lot of materials, you know. You, you, you are giving basic amenities, you know, in the, in the custody. So how did he now have access to go to uh, the mosque, to go and pray, somebody who is in custody? And where was he kept? A lot of questions have, left, have been left unanswered. Now, if he went to pray, that's why I say the issue of compromise is more likely. If he went to pray and absconded from that place, the people on duty should have raised the alarm that we cannot find this man. Because he cannot just move out from uh, the custody straight to the airport. So the period with which he escaped and he uh, was noticed, he must have gone to his house to pack his things and possibly have access to uh, another passport that was not in the knowledge of uh, the security agencies. So, like I said, uh, compromise is more likely than uh, uh, negligence. But I'm also happy that at least the Office of the National Security Advisor came up with a statement instead of allowing people to speculate because it would have been worse but when the social media and others begin to speculate. So I think they must be commended at least for uh, issuing a statement owning up to their own negligence. Uh, this issue, like the NSA office said, is being investigated and it must be thoroughly investigated to know circumstances surrounding his escape or release in that particular circumstance. So I think it's a, it's a very serious matter that must be looked into seriously. Right. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your insight on that. Now, let's take a look at the detention that is being uh, perceived as illegal by many on many fronts, especially his wife has been advocating for the fact that uh, he's illegally detained in Nigeria. The premise of that argument is that he was given a 14-day detention order, and that expired on March 12th. So is there a case for Interpol to pursue? Is this man actually a wanted man if the terms of his detention had actually expired? Uh, I, I don't think that comes up because from uh, all uh, the information I also gathered, it was renewed for another 14 days pending the, his appearance in court in the next due date. So uh, the issue of illegal detention cannot that not just also justify uh, his uh, escape. Maybe I, I mean it's it's baffling to me. Is let's just leave the issue of uh, 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 whether he was legally or illegally detained because he was detained on court order. Okay, so a couple of things. Number one, sir, I know you security agents. When you have somebody on your list like that, you guys have something called a hot list, where the names are dropped by the DSS and all of that in the airport. Is it that this man's name was not on the hot list, that he went through an immigration officer and they checked and he couldn't corroborate with the hot list? That's number one. N number two will be the question of, why did he have to go and pray in the mosque? But I think the wife was saying that the place they kept it was a comfortable place. The last time I checked, any Muslim could probably even pray in their room. So why did they have to go to the mosque if there was no level of complicity? Secondly, who was helping him keep or hold these Kenyan passports that he used to leave? Because when he came in and they said, talked about declaration of passports, probably the Kenya, he came into Nigeria with that, his UK passport that was taken. So the Kenya passport will have been an after arrangement. Who helped issue that? What is the trail? Have you guys been able to even go to the Kenyan embassy in Nigeria and look, was there a possibility of a new issuance or the passport was with him? Who was safekeeping? Some questions like that. Yeah, yeah you raised a lot of questions too. Um, the State Security Service uh, places uh, suspects on watch list and uh, unless you make a request on watch list or is a case being handled and investigated by the 
by the SSS. You don't just pl uh, place a pe people on watch list. So if the NSA had uh, contacted the SSS that this man is being investigated, place him on watch list. But uh, it, it would have been a different thing. But he was not placed on watch list and he traveled through the normal route from, the investiga from what information we have. Investigation will reveal whether he actually traveled as being alleged uh, through a Middle East airline. And uh, if that is it, the case, and it's been confirmed that he traveled through the airport, then there are lapses. That is why I also still emphasize on the issue of compromise, because it must have been arranged. If he was to escape, they make such arrangement and uh, allow him travel. On his passport, we understand he has a British and Kenyan uh, uh, passport. Was it not to the knowledge of history of the NSA or people investigating that he had two passports? If you knew he had two passports, the two passports would have been impounded. And so there are, there are a lot of issues that uh, to, to, to be investigated. And I think the earlier the, the NSA does that, the better, so that we know the truth. And not only that, efforts, like you said, should be made to bring him back to face a trial. That's the most important thing. Because if you see the enormity of the crime, alleged crime he committed, it affected, it affected our economy and so on, it, we, we, the man must be brought to trial. And the company itself, the Binance. Okay, Mr. Michael Jofo, you, I think you were in the service when this same thing happened with Charles Taylor, if my memory serves me right. And immediately, President Olusha Gwambasujo ordered that he must be rearrested. And they found him on the way to the border. Couldn't we have nipped this in the border in time? And can you tell us your experiences about when this happened with Charles Taylor then? You see, that's uh, the issue I raised earlier. The time he allegedly escaped and the time he got to the airport cannot be less than two hours. Because first of all, he will go to his house to pack his things and possibly take a, a, a vehicle to the airport. So it's, uh, like I said, it needs to be investigated. Then on the issue of Charles Taylor, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I, don't have, I, I can't remember the details now, but I know that there was escape and he was uh, subsequently rearrested. But in this particular place, within a short period, all the travel arrangements have been made, and he has escaped. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, Michael uh, the, the Charles Taylor case is even a different case. You know, uh, we don't need to go into the details. But here, we're dealing with two persons arrested for economic sabotage, which is a very serious matter. Sabotage, exactly. Economic sabotage. Now, is it standard operating procedure to put people who are guilty of uh, uh, economic sab sabotage in a guest house and allow them access to phone and in fact indulge them so much that they could go to the mosque to pray with a state escort and to the extent that the wife of the man that escaped will say oh her husband was well treated by the Nigerian authorities because you security people you talk about standard operating procedure so do you keep uh, people who have questions to answer with something as serious as economic sabotage in a guest house where they are served uh, sumptuous meals. Now, as to the issue raised earlier on, the uh, remand order was granted to the EFCC on February 28. So his detention, it was still within the order. And in any case, under the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, you can always extend the remand order. That's the leeway that the Administration of Criminal Justice Act of 2015 allows. So the question of whether he was illegally detained does not even arise at all. But now, what should be the consequences? We have been told that the person, you know, uh, guarding him, they've been arrested, but they, there should be other consequences. Should he not be officially declared a fugitive? And what steps should the Nigerian state take? The fact that the matter is in the court and all that, the man is already a flight risk. He's gone, he's gone. What are those consequences that we should be looking at? Well, like you rightly started, you know, sabotage is one of the crimes against the state, which falls under the purview of the state security service. 
You have sabotage, you have espionage, subversion, insurgency, terrorism. These are crimes against the state, which ordinarily falls under the purview of uh, the state security service. So I don't know. This thing is shrouded in a lot of controversy and mystery that the office of the NSA is now investigating a case and the man is put in a guest house. It goes against all known procedures and practice. I, I, I just don't get it. I can't add these things together. So for, for him, to be, he must be brought back, uh, like uh, the office of the NSA and the federal government has announced, that liaising with the Interpol to ensure his rearrest. And uh, in fact, as we speak, nobody has heard of him. Nobody knows where he is. He has not made a statement and nobody has said he moved to this country or to this country. But I can tell you that uh, with the collaborative efforts of all the agencies and the Interpol, he will soon be rearrested. I have that confidence. Right. So, uh, so that the, when he course... comes, he will be able to tell us how he escaped. Right. Uh, so, of course, two executives, one has now escaped. What is the fate of the gentleman who is still in custody? Is he still in the guest house? Uh, will his terms, uh, the way he's being treated, will that change? What, are the, what should we expect? Uh, and, uh, you know, if you were in the line of duty currently, what advice would you give as to how to further manage the executive that we still have in custody here in Nigeria? You know, the problem in Nigeria is that... Uh, we learn from our mistakes, and uh, unfortunately, there are no consequences for wrongdoings. But this uh, particular case, the people are in custody and they are, being, they are being interrogated. And I expect that the people who are on duty now must be more vigilant, not just being more vigilant. They must be, the remaining person must be sent into proper custody by either sending the person to the prosecuting agency, which is the uh, EFCC, or you send him to the uh, state security service custody, because this sabotage is crime against the state. So I think that's, uh, that, that settles the matter. Okay, good. Sabotage is crime against the state. I deliberately put up the Charles Taylor case because that's the nearest to all of this debacle in a while. And the prompt nature at which we solve that Save Nigeria a lot of embarrassment. And that's why I'm trying to trace the trail of the same thing too that happened in this case. In this case too, there was complicity. When he left the lodge and he got on and he moved out. But immediately the story came out and he was tracked. In this time frame, the only difference we have here is the fact that this man could get to the airport quickly in no time. And that's why I deliberately asked about the hot list. Sir, I put it to you, there's no way in the world that a man that will have been arrested by the NSA for such a crime, an economic crime, would not have been put on the hot list. There is no way. Even people that are arrested for, you know, talking against the government and things like that and all of that. There are a lot of Nigerians that have still been on that hot list since God knows when. That they have to lobby for their names to finally be pulled out of that hot list. So we are resident, we brought these people in for a national case like Binance, and there was no hot list. So what is really going on here? Or could we say that this channel of complicity well, spreads up to the airport authorities? You see, uh, Rufai, if you place somebody on watch list, possibly uh, this uh, suspect has two passports with different names. I told you when we started that watch list is, action on watch list is taken on request. I don't think, I'm not saying for sure, I don't think the state security service is involved in this matter. Ordinarily, that would have been the first thing to do. But not only that, the passport is in custody of the Office of the National Security Advisor. As the investigation is going, possibly at the end of the investigation, you, put, you place such person on watch list. Watch list is to ensure that the person does not flee the country uh, through the normal routes. But this one, like we have said, it's, it's not been established. His allegation was saying that he left through the Middle East airline. It could have been that he used another passport with another name 
And if the watch list is bearing his name and the passport he used in traveling is uh, different from what, there's nothing you can do about it. These are issues. Not even, not even, not even based on traveling. facial recognition? Not even based on, because this was a national, this was a story that facial, the man's face was after. Not, not even based on face, facial recognition? Rufai, you have look-alike, not facial recognition. You talk of uh, data, fingerprints, and the names. Mm. That is the basis from which you will start. Not facial recognition. You have so many look-alikes. So, in fact, not, not even that, based uh, on fingerprints uh, and all in, of that? In, 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 I say based on fingerprint. That's okay. what I said. Fingerprint. That, suppose you use uh, a fake name. So, would you go to data when you don't have the, the name to match the data on the name? Suppose it has another name. You know, prior to this time, area of uh, uh, this internet and all this advanced technology, Nigerians used to remove their passport and place in another passport. If the, the, if, if the white man sees it abroad, they, they, they hardly can recognize because they believe all the black people look alike. So it's the data that we should concentrate on, not the facials. Thank you so much for that. Okay, what next? Okay. And still on the Chastelo story, Chastelo was granted asylum by Nigeria. He was, in fact, a host of the Nigerian government because before things went one way or the other and it was allowed passage and then, you know, so government was involved. There are two different things. We're dealing here with criminality. I asked yes. you earlier on, how far should the consequences go? Because the uh, guards who took the uh, man to the uh, mosque, they were acting on, uh, probably on instructions. Who do you think could have given that uh, directive, take him to the mosque within the chain of command? And shouldn't such people be sanctioned? That is also on the realm of speculation. Until investigation is conducted <laughs> and we have the details. But in practice, it safe. is wrong. This is your boy, you are playing safe. Suspect. No, 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 not playing safe. No, I'm not playing safe. You cannot take a suspect of that uh, 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 category to the mosque to go and pray. I have had uh, Muslims and Christians in custody. They pray wherever they are, within the, the precincts of the, the custody. So you don't need to take something. In fact, I understand he was even given uh, uh, telephone facilities and all what, making contacts. And that would have facilitated his uh, easy escape from where he is because he must have told this person, go to the airport, go to this place, go to this place. And you, you, there was no time you know, to, to in, intervene immediately to bring him to, to, to stop him from traveling out of the country. Right. Uh, Mr. Mike Edgio for former director DSS, we thank you so much for your time and your contributions this morning.